<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Kerry Writers Museum. How's everybody today? I'm I'm just putting my own phone on um, silent because I'm I'm shocking and I'm actually can't even turn the comp. There we go. No, turning off the sound. There we go. Welcome. So we say here in Ireland, Cade Mila Falter River. So that's a hundred thousand welcomes to you all. <laughs> You know, and it's so lovely to see you. So I'm going to I'm going to call on people one at a time um, just to, to have a little chat. And it's World Storytelling Day. So can we have hands in the air for World Storytelling Day? Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> and to everybody there in my storytelling world, these lovely people I met in Marrakesh. But before I met them in Marrakesh, I met them on the World Storytelling Cafe and it was under the cyber cloud. So we're going to talk a little bit today about stories and about lost and found. And we're going to hear a fantastic story from each um, one of these brilliant storytellers. <laughs> um, so, um, so here we go. So um, I suppose lads, you know, uh, two years ago, uh, three days before St. Patrick's Day, we got the news that we were going to be closed down and that all of our live gigs were gone. And I know that we've had conversations um, where everybody found themselves in that boat. And then very, very quickly, we got ourselves retrained. And that's one of the fantastic creative juices of the storyteller that no matter what happens, the stories have to be told, especially on St. Patrick's Day. So, <laughs> so you know, maybe I come to you first, Sarah. Um, what's your memory of, you know, the great shutdown and then the great reopening and the finding of these storytellers? Well, that week was just like a curtain came over, mm -hmm. just a big curtain and everything stopped. And I've been really busy in schools. And then it must have been about a week later, we had a meeting with some storytellers who were going to meet live. And we said, we'll meet online and we'll practice. And actually, when it came to it, I think only three of us wanted to actually practice. Everybody was in the room and they were all going, oh, no, I don't think I can tell us. No, I, I don't think I can actually get on the screen and tell the story. I can't. Yeah. So there were loads of storytellers sitting around going, OK, well, uh, yeah, that, that was interesting. And I think in the first few months, some people were really for it and some people were really against it. Mm -hmm. And I know there was lots of versions where we recorded a story because Daisy Black did the, um, the oh, of which I can't remember, but it was all about the people going away and hiding from the plague in Italy and telling stories. So she... <laughs> It. Thank you. And uh, so I know people from all around the world who put stories in for that. Yeah. And and uh, within a couple of weeks, I heard of the World Storytelling Cafe. I had a group online and it just sort of grew, didn't it? Like a great yeah. big wave. Yeah. And it, it was it was absolutely amazing when we all met one another as well. I really loved that. I loved you know, kind of walking down the streets of Marrakesh and catching hold of people's arms and going, you're real. I don't believe it. This is amazing, you know. Um, and I suppose another thing, going back to the, the start of getting online and none of us knew the craft of telling stories online and we were all into the cameras like this. <laughs> stories <laughs> Until we realised that we could sit back and almost treat that camera like another person in the room, you know, and I, I suppose we, we've had a great gift of recording the story since then. And Kerry Writers Museum set up an archive, which we're very proud of, and a whole load of letters coming in saying how, um, you know, how lovely it was to be in contact with people now, you know, so I'm just um, bringing up participants there because I think there's somebody else knocking on the cyber door. Apologies for that. And if you mm -hmm. were knocking, please knock again because we can let you in now. So that was something we lost. We lost the ability to tell our stories live back in those times. And then we found a new place to tell stories and we got to tell stories online. And I've heard all of you guys telling stories online. 
So maybe we get a story now, you know, and then come back to the chat afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sarah, since I started with you, would it be okay to get a story from you first? Yes, all right. Great. So I'm going to mute everybody. So I'll be muting you as well. Um, there we go. And then if you could unmute Sarah, that would be brilliant. There you go. Me, and candy. now I'm going to allow you off to tell a story. Can't wait to see what you're going to tell us. We love hearing as much as we love telling. Okay. So because it's all about going back to the beginning, this is a story that I found, lost and found. And it's about um, the town where my father lives, near where I used to live in Somerset, called Wincanton. It was market day in Wincanton, and the young master from the big house nearby had come in with his horse. Well, no, not really. He said he came in to uh, check that his father's cows were being sold. But really, he had a new horse. He had spent everything on this horse, everything he owned and a little bit more. And if you are an admirer of horse flesh, this was a beautiful, beautiful, dark horse. So dark, it was like a shadow. So shiny, oh, beautiful. And it shook its head, its proud, proud head and looked round at everybody. It was a beautiful horse. And the young master enjoyed parading it around the town. Friday was market day. Market day is bedlam. It's marketplace and it goes down the hill. There are a lot of pubs in Wincanton, even now. And then it was a staging post for the, uh, the post horses. And so it was very busy. So as he paraded his horse, everyone wanted to offer him a drink, didn't they? And have a chat about the horse. And it went on, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, hour, hour and a half, two hours. Yes, every drink, every drink was drunk. Every compliment was received until it got to mid-afternoon. And then one of his friends turned up. Ha, he said. It's a nice horse, but it's not as good as mine. Oh, yes, said the young master. It is very fast. I bet I can get from here to home in 12 minutes. Now, home was quite a way away, the big house outside Wincanton. But as soon as he'd said that, of course, we are a racing town as well. And a racing town needs no questions asked about a slight gamble. Just say a slight gamble. Soon everybody in the town was on that slight gamble. Yes, even the mayor came down and was ready. In minutes, there was a race course set out going up the town and out. People had gathered on other horses, on carts, on anything because they were going to watch the race. The young master got on his beautiful horse. It was so ready to run and it was flashing its tail around so the mayor was told he was going to start the race he raised a handkerchief quite a ridiculously small thing for the amount of people around but it was traditional and as the handkerchief dropped the race was on and the horse darted up up the main street out of the town out through bayford out and then it would turn left across the fields. The cavalcade of vehicles following it was amazing. Everybody had leapt on something to see what was going on. It was so exciting. And they were shouting the commentary as you would at a race course, saying, yes, he was making it, looking at the times. No, he wasn't going to make it. Yes, he was. No, he wasn't. Then as you get outside, there's a bit where he had to go up the hill and you can see right across the veil as he goes up into the woods. And that's when they saw it. A sleek, smaller, black shape was following the horse. And one after one, the call came up. Black dog, black dog. There was an intake of breath for everyone knew the story of the black dog and the masters of Stalton. 
It was a potent of death. Others shook it off. No, you're imagining it in it. It's just a shadow. But that raucous crowd was suddenly getting quieter. And they saw the young man race up to take off over a stone wall. Up he went high into the air. The horse looked beautiful, but there was definitely something behind it, something that frightened the horse. And suddenly horse and rider were collapsing and rolling over the other side. Silence in the onlookers. And then, Noise again as they all raced to check what was happening, one after the other pelting across and up the hill. It was slower for them because they had to take the pathways. When they got there, there was a mess. The horse had fallen on his master and the horse had broken in both front legs. The master was crushed. There was nothing left but to pick up the body. And that's what they did, all muttering the black dog. And the mayor was sent back to his home to tell his father the tale. And it went down in the annals as another young man of that family who suffered at the hands of the black dog of Winkerton. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> We love a scary tale here in Lishtol. Oh my God, that was great. And we also have a big horse racing uh, community here. There's the Lishtol races every year, just after the Lishtol Storytelling Festival. You All have right. on this year, Sarah. It's on in September, you know. So that was amazing. That was really good. And that was, that was a story that you collected right at the start of the the yeah, business. yeah, oh, God. yeah. And that went. That started me um, applying for a grant, and I got my grant to do a oh. project in Wincanton. Oh, so, that's amazing! But that was a bit of a brutal story to stick on the wall of a house. <laughs> Use it. <laughs> I know, I know. It is, it is absolutely amazing. Well, I'm just going to say that during your story, we were joined by another master storyteller. This from this time from Belfast, Sharon, Sharon Dixon. So she's there and hello to you, Sharon. And hopefully what? we get a story from Sharon in a minute as well, which is great, you know. So then looking at the other things um, that might have that we might have felt we lost during um, COVID times, one of the things that we looked into was our connection with the elders, you know, and what they bring to the table and the beautiful um, treasures of memories that they have. And there was a saying that was going around in Bealtaine, which was that when a, an old person dies, a library burns down. And I've heard you guys say that. I've heard, you know, I thought that was a saying from this country, but I've heard it said in every country during these past two years, you know. So I'm just wondering, did did anybody here do work with 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 their elders? And I'll tell you about the work with our elders then afterwards. Claire, did you put up your hand there? So I'm just going to ask you to unmute. Yeah, I, I, um, an easy elder, my own mum actually, oh, um, because um, uh, Sarah might remember this because um, variety of reasons i spent a lot of the various lockdowns with my mum I'm currently at her house now um uh, so i could uh, add some support for her um all legal all legal within the framework <laughs> um and one of the things that happened is that um I'm, i was doing some clearing out and i happened to uh, get down some information because she in the war lived in Hamlin so she went uh, after the war uh, her father was stationed there and we were talking about where she lived in Hamlin and that evening that very evening it was a Sarah's storytelling group and I'd chosen a story and in the middle as I was going along I suddenly wanted to tell the Pied Piper of Hamelin, despite the fact I've never told it before, because my mum had told me about how uh, living in Hamelin, how there were these kind of really bad statues, memorising it, and, and how the house she lived in, and how she could walk to that and down, all the details of Hamelin. And uh, 
and I was able to kind of use her memories of Hamlin in the story that evening. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Would you like to tell us that story now? Or do you have another story? It's I, I, I can do that one, actually. I've got another one. Um, but I, I need to get a prop, is the only thing, if I tell it. Okay. Give, me, give me a second and I'll get a prop. Give you two minutes to go and get the prop. And while she's going to get the prop, I see that we have another person after coming in, the fantastic Baden Prince. How are you, Baden? Great to see you. You know, and we've been talking about how we've all gotten to know one another under the COVID cloud and how it was brilliant to meet one another in the flesh in Marrakesh, you know, and to be able to have sessions with one another, you know. So great to see you, Baden. And we're going to be coming to you for a story in a minute. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> ready? World my, storytelling day. My, 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 micro, my microphone's not working. It's working. I can hear you, I can hear you fine, baby. <laughs> no one gets away. But for now, I'm just going to go back to our lovely Claire, who has found her prop. So go on, Claire, tell us your story. So, as I said, uh, after the war, my grandfather was stationed in Hamlin. And there's a lot of stories my mum's told me about him being stationed in Hamlin. But one of the things is that while he was there, he commissioned this. And as you can see it, it's a very, very beautiful carving of the Pied Piper and there's little rats down here. And the thing is, this is the traditional, what the Pied Piper's pipe looked like. And that's a shawm. It's not a pipe, it's a shawm. And a shawm is a reeded instrument. And a shawm is a loud outdoor instrument for dancing. And so that's what colours my telling of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. So as everyone knows, in Hamlin, there were rats. There were rats absolutely everywhere. Wherever you went, wherever you moved, whatever you did, there was a rat. There was a rat looking at you if you opened a cupboard, if you closed a cupboard, if you walked up the stairs, if you walked down the street. There was a rat in the flower. There was a rat in everything. No food was rat free. All the bread had a rat in the middle of it. And the people of Hamlin were fed up like this. The people of Hamlin couldn't bear it anymore because no one likes having the beady eyes of a rat staring back at them in it, all your intimate moments. And it was quite a prosperous town at then, it is now. And so they gathered under the mayor and they said, what are you doing? What are you doing to sort out this rat problem? And the mayor says, we've tried everything. We've tried everything. But the rats are too clever, they don't eat the poison. They eat the bread, but they don't eat the poison. We can't trap them, they beat up the cats. What are we gonna do? We've tried everything. But you haven't tried me, said a voice from the back of the meeting. And they all turned round, they all turned round and they saw a man in pied clothes. Now the thing about the term, the pied piper, everyone knows it, but they don't know what that means, pied means clothes of many colours and that means someone who was too poor to have clothes made of plain cloth. They could only make clothes made of rags that other people threw away and they sewed together. It meant he was poor. He was also a piper playing the shawm, a shawm that's a bit susceptible to play because you have to distort your face to play it. People will dance to it, but the nobles won't play it. So they looked at the Pied Piper and the Pied Piper looked at them and said, for 5,000 gold, gold florins, I'll get rid of your rat problem. Now that's a lot of money in any time. But the rat problem is huge. And they tried to kind of bid him down, but the Pied Piper, well, he could go to another town and they lived in Hamlin. And so they agreed. If he got rid of every rat, every rat, they would give him the 5,000 florins. And so he took, he picked up his pipe and he started to play. He started to play. And it was a foot 
tapping dance he was playing. It was a foot tapping dance and all the people, they felt their feet tapping, but they didn't have to follow it. They felt the call, but it was easy to resist, but all the rats. And the piper went to the top of the hill of Hamlin because my mother told me about Hamlin. She told me it's built on a hill. And at the top, the piper started. At the top, the piper started. And he walked down the winding road from the top of the hill to the river at the bottom of Hamlin. So my mother told me about the river in Hamlin as well and how it goes at the bottom of the town. And the piper walked that winding road down the whole of Hamlin. And as he went, he played his pipe and the rats danced. The rats danced. They couldn't help themselves. They had no desire. They wanted to dance. They couldn't stop themselves. The people could, could. but the rats, they found themselves automatically coming out of the houses, coming out of the basements, running behind the pipe piper and dancing behind him as they went down. They danced and they danced and they danced as the pied piper walked into the river and they danced and they danced and they danced until they drowned. Everyone, every piper, every rat. Because the people of Hamlin, they went from the bottom of the town back up the hill, back up the hill to the top of the town and they couldn't find one rat. Everyone was drowned in the river, been washed away. And so the piper turned to the people, turned to the people and said, well, all the rats are gone. I'd like my 5,000 florins now. And the people looked at the piper. He was too poor to have clothes made from plain cloth. He wore what rags other people threw away. He was poor, he was a stranger, and they knew if they didn't pay him, there was nothing he could do about it. And they looked at him. They looked at his disreputable appearance and they said, how do we know you didn't send the rats? This could all be a ploy from you. This could all be a ploy. You sent the rats so you could cheat us, so you could make us pay the money. I think you're a treat, cheat and a fraud. I think this is all done to you. This is a some kind of scheme. And if we find out later, if we ask around, I bet we find you're a murderer. I bet if we ask around, we find there's a jail looking for you. If not worse, a hangman's rope. I think you better go. I think you better go now before we find out where you're wanted. Well, they were right. The piper could do nothing about it. He was so poor, he could only be dressed in the rags other people threw away. And there was nothing he could do to make these people pay up. He said, but you promised. And they said, the time's running out. And he said, okay, I won't have my florins. I can't make you pay them, but I will take something else. And he once again lifted that shawm to his lips. Now shawms are played for dancing and they make your feet want to move, but that wasn't the song he played this time. The tune he played this time was like a seduction. Notes you don't normally hear from a shawm, mellow. And they went in the ear and they stayed there. They went in the ear and they stayed in the mind and all the people, all the adults find they'd gone in their head and they'd gone to their feet and their feet were solid, stuck to the ground. But all the children, all the children found that, that seduction made their feet move. That seduction made their feet move and followed the piper as he once again went from the top of the hill down the winding road down to the river. Now I've not been to Hamlin but my mother tells me about it. And she told me at the bottom of the hill there's a cave and when she was there in that cave there were statues. There were statues of a Pied Piper and children. And that's because as the Pied Piper went down, the children followed him to the cave. And as he walked past the parents, every time they tried to reach out to grab their child, but their child just walked past and they couldn't move, they couldn't reach and they couldn't get close enough. 
And when the children walked out of sight, all they could do was listen to the sound of the pipe, the sound of the pipe as it went into the mouth of the cave and echoed louder and louder. And they struggled against, they struggled to move. But then suddenly the piping was gone and the children with it. And the people of Hamlin never saw their children again. So it only goes to show you just because you've got the power to do something doesn't really mean you should. And that's my story. Oh my God. Another scary story. <laughs> the people of Nishdol can't wait to meet you now. <laughs> that's really good. Thank you so much, Claire. I'm just going to invite everybody back in now for a second. And I know that our lovely Eamon Keenan is trying to get in. Oh, here he is. So admitting him there now. Yay! So I'm just uh, saying to the whole of Kerry and to all our other listeners, how wonderful it is to have found one another. It's just amazing to have found one another during this time, to have found the new technology, to have been able to hold hands across the sea um, in different places and to be able to tighten our bonds as storytellers together. So in celebration of this World Storytelling Day 2022, we come online again, you know, um, and I'm going to um, head across there now to our lovely Norman Perrin. Norman comes all the way from North America or Canada. So I'm just bringing him up there now. And we, um, so Norman, what time of the day at all is it over there? It's 10.30, the uh, 10 time change. My, my goodness. And what time did I ring you? While I was asleep, um, 7.15. <laughs> oh my goodness, you know. But, so. but normally I'm up that hour. So, uh, so you were, your instincts were right, but I was... I was a little out of sync. Yeah, that's yes. it, you know. So um, I'm, I'm on our lovely theme of Lost and Found. Do you have a story for us about the Lost and Found, Norman? Yes, I do. But I also wanted to, to just mention Marrakesh for a moment. And yes. what happened there for, for me, everything was not just shut down, but something we had to shut down while it was just starting was a storytelling festival. We had storytellers on the way from overseas. We had people traveling across Canada. It truly was a shutdown and to untangle that. But, you know, as you said, through Zoom, through other means, we found stories because we have to tell stories. We have to listen to the stories. It's more than the Pied Piper's pipe. We, the stories just reach out to us and say, OK, you can't keep us down. We use that Zoom technology and uh, and so we did. Exactly, you know, and it was it was such a joy to meet you in real life when when we got to um, Marrakesh and I'm looking forward to your upcoming visit to Ireland. Mm -hmm. I hope you'll make it down. Yes. You know, you'll I know. hope so, too, because then I will be visiting uh, County Cork, yes. where my ancestors came from. Woo! <laughs> and also you, you have to come to Kerry because I'm the storyteller in residence for mm -hmm. um, for uh, the beautiful Kerry Writers Museum and we'd love to see you and a whole load of these storytellers are coming for a secret shh, a secret visit next weekend. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. So okay. I'm going to take myself off the line now because a good few of our wonderful storytellers um, the, where we've all met in the Cyberlands have come online to celebrate this beautiful day of Word Storytelling Day. So I'm going to take myself off to hear your story and I'll be lining people up. So I'm actually going to come back to Ireland after this one to our fantastic, um, let me see now, where she gone? Oh, she might be gone. I'll come back to after the story and I will line up a few people um, for the, the next stories. So. I'm going to take myself out and away you go with your gorgeous story. Thanks, Norman. Thank you.
Now, I don't know why my ancestors left Ireland. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons to choose from. But they ended up in Canada, north of Toronto. And my father's uh, family uh, lived there. But we eventually moved to the Ottawa Valley. And uh, that's where I was born and raised. And when I left the valley, I didn't know about storytelling, but somehow storytelling jumped several generations and came up like a spring from deep inside the ground. And where it came up? Well, it came up in the Ottawa Valley and Black Bay Road. And there I, well, we had our farm and next door was my uncle Norman's farm. And why he's named Norman and I am as well, that's a story for another time. Now, there's always chores to be done on the farm. Uh, hauling water, chopping wood, clearing the pathways of snow in the winter. But, you know, I always prefer to do the work, the chores on my Uncle Norman's farm. Because, you see, whenever I remark on something, he would say, well, there's a story to that. And I knew what to do. I would go over to the table, put down two mugs, get the teapot that was always full of tea, pour out two cups of tea hot steaming tea and then take a sip and he would tell the tale and this morning i says you know uncle norman that's the best tea i've ever had this uh just now he says well there's a story to that too and this is i'm sorry this is the wrong story that's the wrong beginning there's a story yes he said but i was looking beyond the cup of tea at the wall and on the wall, there's a picture. And the picture was that of a tall, sad-looking man with a fiddle in his hand. And I asked him, well, why, why is he holding that fiddle and it hasn't got any strings on the fiddle? He says, well, there's a story to that. And this is the story they told me. When I was a young one, like you, and I know you'll wander around like I did in my old days, you'll have lots of stories to tell, I'm sure. Well, back in the dirty 30s, as they called it, <laughs> there's a lot of people traveling from one end of the country to the other looking for work. And so it was no surprise that uh, people saw a tall, thin man dressed in dusty clothes with a bag upon his back coming up Black Bay Road. And he went past Freedom McNabb's place, then Gord Milky's place, and then, as if he knew exactly where he was going, up to Oscar Michael's place. And there he knocked on the door, and Oscar answered it. And uh, the O'Donoghue, for that was his name, and the only name we ever knew him by, said, I'm looking for work. Well, Oscar had just lost a farm worker who had uh, gone to visit relatives in Ireland. And he needed him for the harvest, so he was glad of the help. And the Adonihue settled into his house, and he was a good worker, working hard in the fields at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, there was an extra treat for what was in that bag but a fiddle. And when he pulled that fiddle out and tuned it up, he could play stories that are merry and sad, that made the sorrowful happy and the happy sorrowful. But it was always a good tune. Now, but he was a bit of a peculiar one. For you see, on the nights when the uh, moon was full and the skies were, were clear, he would head out into the woods and at midnight. But before he headed out, he would take his fiddle, he would pull the strings all off the fiddle and off the bow, and then he would head up out into the forest. And then a few hours later, he would come back with a tune, sometimes merry, sometimes sad, but always worth listening to. And I wanted to find out more than anything else in the whole world. What was it that the O'Donoghue did on the nights when the sky was clear, the moon was full? And he went into the forest. For you see, on the nights when the moon was full and the sky was cloudy, he just stayed home like everyone else did. But I 
I needed an excuse to spy on the Adani. He was not con considered very respectful uh, in those days. And so I needed an excuse. And this is my excuse. There was an old grass rake that my grandfather had borrowed from Oscar's father and then never returned it because, well, they never needed it with the new machinery that they got. That was what I was going to do. And so I went into the woodshed and I rummaged around and I found the old uh, grass rake. And I pulled it down and waited for in a few days, it would be the full moon. Now it was midwinter at this time and it was a cold, 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 cold winter. Not like the sort of thing, cold winters they have these days. In those days, it was cold. And so that night, the night of the full moon, the sky was clear. And I rake in hand, I went down our driveway. The snow was squeaking at every step. And I went up Oscar Michael's uh, driveway. And I came to his door and I knocked on the door. And he answered the door. Now it was just five minutes to midnight. And inside I could see the O'Donoghue already sitting underneath the clock with his fiddle taking the strings off. Now, the, now Oscar knew exactly what I was there for. And I could tell that he didn't like it one bit. But I said, here, here's the gas rake my uh, uh, father, uh, grandfather borrowed from your uh, father. And I thought it was high time we returned it. And so they did that. And Oscar said, thank you very much, Norman. And he took the rake and he leaned it up against the wall. And of course, he had to invite me for a cup of tea. And he poured out a mug of tea. And I sat there sipping that hot tea, watching the O'Donoghue take his strings off his fiddle and his bow, one by one by one. And when it struck midnight and the fiddle was uh, stringless, he got up and he went out to the uh, door. And I quickly drank the rest of my tea, burning my tongue. He says, well, Oscar, it's a long day tomorrow. Time to go see you. And I rushed out and out into the yard. And there in the uh, new fallen snow, there's footprints in the snow heading into the forest. And as soon as I saw those footprints, I knew exactly where the O'Donoghue was going. Don't ask me why, how I knew, but I knew. He was headed to the clearing in the middle of the woods. And in the middle of that clearing was a great white pine. Now once those great white pines had covered the Ottawa Valley and the lumberjacks came and they thought that that uh, forest would last forever, but it only took 50 years for every single one of those great white pines, those great giants to be felled. And there's only a few here and there that were left. And Oscar Michael had said, that tree will stand as long as I live, even though it was worth a lot of money. That's where he was going. And so I ran among the trees, through the bushes, as fast as I could, and I came to the clearing. And in the clearing, standing there like a great giant, 150 feet tall, was a great white pine. Behind it was the full moon. And I waited. It was cold. And I shivered a little bit. But I waited until into the clearing there came the O'Donoghue. And he took a couple steps, stood there in the moonlight, and he looked around to see as, that there was nobody else there. Then he walked over to the great white pine and the needles of the white pine were breaking the moonlight into thin streams of moonlight. And he stood there for a moment and then he reached up and he snapped off one of the moonbeams and he put that on his fiddle. He reached up again and again until his fiddle and his bow were strung with pure moonlight. And then he lifted up the fiddle 
and the bow, and he began to play. And I wish I could tell you what those the tune he was playing. But the notes were so thin and so soft, I could barely hear them. And not only that, the cold, the intense cold, was causing the notes to freeze in midair. And they were drifting onto the ground. And without thinking, I stepped forward. And I stepped on one of the, the notes, snapping it, cracking it. And when I did that, the O'Donoghue stopped playing. He looked straight at me. And I'll never forget the look on his face. It was a look of a man who had wandered the world over looking for a home, looking for a place where he could rest, looking for a home. Now, once again, because he had been spied upon, once again, he would have to take to the open road. And he walked through the moonlight and into the shadows and disappeared. And I ran across. I wanted to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But there in the snow, the footprints of the, where the footprints met the shadow, the snow was smooth as smooth can be. Nobody ever saw the O'Donoghue again. I went over to, back to Oscar's place and I confessed everything and he said, when I finished my story, he said, Norman, go home. I think you've done enough. Now, I thought first that the melody was lost. No one did ever hear, hear it except for maybe me. But Oscar Michael knew a thing or two. And he went over to the clearing and he waited until the sun came up. And when the sun shone upon those frozen notes upon the snow, one by one they began to melt. And one by one he heard them and he remembered them. For Oscar was a good fiddler himself. And he remembered that song and he began to play it at all the weddings and dances, etc. But you know, no matter how many times he practiced that song, no matter how time, many times he played that melody, which became the lost melody, one note would always go. That was the one I had stepped upon. So now I've told you a story of a song that was lost, a song that was found. And as my uncle Norman said, Norman, remember all the stories, remember the stories from no matter wherever you go, when you are lost, it is the stories that will bring you back home. Thank you. Woo woo! Indeed, a wise message all the way from Canada. Thank you so much, Norman. That was gorgeous. And I am just going to, um, one second there now, I'm just going to bring everybody back into the view there for a second. Hello, Gok Dina. Lovely to see you. I know Eamon is here. Eamon, could I ask you to unmute if you don't mind? And I'm not sure if you have video. Eamon is coming in all the way from Lanzarote and it's lovely to see him. But we can't see him at the moment. Okay, so Eamon, if later on you find that you can unmute, if you could let me know, that would be great. And we might get a little story from you. But for now, he's lost in the cyberlands, in the mists between us and Lanzarote. <laughs> so I hope he's gathering good stories there and he's become unmuted. Eamon, come in, Eamon. Hello. How are you, darling? How's the weather? Oh, it's there? awful. It's awful. It's awful. Uh, I'll just show you a wee bit. <laughs> I'm telling you, we've we can see you now, Eamon. and we know the weather is beautiful. <laughs> ah, for God's You're sake. not making any friends here, you know that. That's right. Claire has said what we're all thinking, you know. <laughs> jealous. <laughs> so we're celebrating. We are jealous. Yes. We might as well admit it. And we're celebrating World Storytelling Day, Eamon. Yes. So yes. it's I... going out live from Kerry Writers Museum. And if you yes. have a story for us on the theme of last no. found, or even if you haven't, even if you've no, just I had have, a story, that would be no, great. I haven't got a story uh, simply because uh, I have to go somewhere very, very quickly oh. uh, to rescue my wife. She's okay. doing shopping and uh, she's shopping. So, um, no, I just wanted to drop in and say hello to all my storytelling friends. Yay. And if you are jealous, tough. 
<laughs> <laughs> we are indeed. We're very jealous, you know. Hey, I'll you see you in, Good to see you too. Hey, friends. <laughs> oh, hello. Those lovely people. Would you like to show us your swimming pools again in case you didn't no. catch it? <laughs> Don't encourage I him. care. We've suffered enough. We've suffered enough. Eamon, just on the on the theme yeah. of Lost and Found and stories, you know, um, can you tell us a treasure that you found in these last two years, a little shining silver lining to the COVID cloud in this story world that we've discovered together and all these lovely people that we've met? I, th I think more than anything, without a doubt, it's actually, even though I don't like Zoom, mm -hmm. it's just that opportunity to tell stories to people around the world. People I would never have thought to have been able to talk to. People literally from around the world. Yeah. And then that ended up uh, in that amazing event that we shared in uh, some of this together in Marrakesh. Yeah. And that for me was uh, very, very, very special. And the other thing that's been shining for me uh, more than anything is that although I have been ill and had cancer, I've lived through it. And the love of my wife uh, was so special. Uh, she just looked after me so well. And uh, I don't think I could be any happier, even though we've been married 50 years, and that's why we're here. Oh, lovely. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Yeah. Oh, my so God. There you go. It's the Brilliant. simple things in life. You know, yes. having someone who loves you and you love them. And uh, being able to, as I say, uh, when people say, how are you? I say, well, I can walk. I can talk and I can toilet myself. Oh. Everything else is a bonus. Eamon, we love you big. We love you so much. You okay. know, so. I better go. Okay. And thank, you the... thank you so much for dropping in. Love you. Okay. Mwah. Take care. Talk love to you soon. God bless. Bye. So, oh, what a lovely piece of wisdom to be coming in, you know, kind of over the waves from the sunshiny place of Lanzarote to us, you know, um, really appreciate that. And now I'm going to call on a woman all the way from Belfast, who's been a great old friend during these times. So I'm just going to find her here now. Let me see. We saw many. It's great uh, coming in that I have to do a little bit of uh, moving around to see how I can um, bring people in. There she is. Hiya, Sharon. How are you, darling? Hiya. Great to see you, you know. So a lot of a lot of my lovely friends from Marrakesh haven't met Sharon yet, but you will meet her, you know, and um, she's an amazing storyteller from Belfast. And one of my favorite things that she does is called the Belfast Blitz. It's a one woman story show. And if you ever get a chance to see it, you have to you have to make sure that you get there. So, Sharon, what have you got for us today? You know, I'm so delighted, uh, Maria, that the people are coming to uh, carry. Yeah. I think um, I read that Baden's not able to make it. Is that right? He he's he's muted at the moment, but he's nodding his head, you know. And we did our best. We used all our charm and persuasion techniques. Go Consider ahead, yourself Nathalie. lucky, Sharon. Consider yourself lucky. <laughs> I'm going. To, I'm bringing you in there now, Baden. Go on, answer, Sharon. Why won't you come to meet us? <laughs> You're missing Baden. I'm telling you. <laughs> I, I've already met them once, Sharon, and honestly, my therapist says. <laughs> <laughs> he says, Barry's key is good for you. <laughs> Bring your therapist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, I'm going to release him now, and we'll come to him for a story next. So be ready, Baden, for the story next. And in the meantime, Sharon, have you got a story for us? Um, it doesn't have to be on theme because this has been a last minute thing. Um, I, to, I was supposed to be in Listowel today, but I got the dreaded text saying that I had to stay in Cork and all my gorgeous, beautiful, handsome <laughs> souls of storytellers came in uh, to be with me instead. And I really, really appreciate it. So Sharon, what story have you for us? Uh, do you know, uh four or five stories is running about my head. I don't know which one to tell, but uh, anyway, I think I've settled on one. Why say? Uh, in the county Roscommon in Ireland. 
a beautiful, beautiful part of this world. There's a little town in it called Balahadrain. And in Balahadrain, in the little town square, there is a, a sculpture. And it's off an old peddler man with the rag poke over his back. And it's dedicated to the peddler of Balahadrain. For the peddler of Balahadrain was the kindest man that you ever did meet. He never had much in the way of riches himself. He just lived in a little small modest cottage and outside in the garden was one apple tree. And he would delight in picking the apples off the tree and sharing them out with all those that lived around. And he also delighted in the company of the little birds that came down to feed upon the apples. And the people would say to him, old man, you're such a fool. Why do you not pick those apples and stalk them up for winter? But he didn't listen. And every time there was a market day or a, a fair day or a gathering of people, the old peddler man would gather up his wares and he would take it to the, the towns near him, set up his little table, his little stall, and the people would come over and buy from him. But, you know, the peddler of Balahadrine had a real heart for children. And when the children would come over and maybe a little boy would pick up a little pen knife and he'd say, oh, peddler man, how much is the pen knife? The peddler man knew that that boy in no way would have enough to buy the little pen knife. And he would say things like, if you were to take that little pen knife, you'd be doing me a favour because it would save me from carrying it around with me. And maybe a little girl would come over and lift a fine piece of lace for her hair. And he would say, little girl, that lace would look nicer as a bow in your hair than what it would ever do sitting on this table. And the people would call him, you're a fool. You give away more than what you sell. But the joy of the children and the laughter of the children paid him more than any coins ever could. But this night, as the peddler lay in bed, he was visited by St. Patrick himself. The peddler man dreamt that St. Patrick had come to him in a dream and said to him, peddler man, take yourself to Dublin and there stand on the bridge that spans the Liffey and there you will hear what you need to hear and see what you need to see. Well, he got up the next morning, rubbed his eyes and he thought that was a strange dream. I felt as though it was St. Patrick himself standing at the end of my bed, as though I could reach out and touch him myself. Well, after the third night of the same dream, the peddler man got to thinking, Maybe, maybe I should listen to the dream. Maybe I should take myself to Dublin. So he set about and he started to walk to Dublin. And it took him three full days to get to Dublin. And when he reached Dublin time there, he stood on the bridge that spanned the Liffey. It was cold and it was wet. And he pulled his collar up round him trying to keep warm. But the people just walked by all the day long. He heard nothing strange and he seen nothing strange. And he thought to himself, when darkness started to fall, oh, what a fool I am, coming here to follow a dream. But do you know, across the way, there was a man that owned the local pub and he had watched that old peddler man all day long. And he noticed that the peddler man was neither selling nor buying. He wasn't speaking to anyone and it baffled him. What would that old man be doing standing on the bridge that spanned the, the Liffey? So the old man, the old peddler man, he felt exhausted. And he decided that he would come and he would sit down outside the pub just for a bit of a rest. And the pub owner came out and he said, old man, I've been watching you all day long and you have stood there 
on the bridge that spans the Liffey and you're neither selling nor buying, what on earth do you be doing? And you can't be sitting there. You're so exhausted. You're as white as a sheet. Come in, come into the pub and sit down. And there the pub, the pub manager, he poured him a good big glass of the black stuff with a lovely creamy head on the top. And he downed the pint of Guinness. Oh, and it tasted good. And he set him down a good big bowl of the Irish stew and he supped it into him. Oh, that furly lined the belly. And he said, old man, I've been watching you. Well, what is it that you've been doing? You've baffled me all day that long watching you. And the old peddler man started to tell him about his dream. The guy had a dream for three nights in a row. And it was as real to me as what you are standing there. I felt that I could reach out and touch the great St. Patrick himself. And he told me to come to the Liffey and stand on the bridge. And I would hear what I needed to hear and see what I needed to see. Well, the pub manager, he let a laugh out of him and he said, old man, you're nothing but a fool. Imagine if we all followed our dreams. Where would we be? For he says, myself, he says, <laughs> I had a dream for three nights in a row that I should go to this wee place called Balahadreen, wherever the heck Balahadreen is. And he says, the dream was that I was to go to the old peddler man's house and outside was an apple tree. And there, if I dug uh, at the, the, apple, the foot of the apple tree, I would find all the gold and silver that I would ever need. Now, where would I be if I'd have followed that dream? Well, the old peddler man said, I don't know where you, you should have been, but by God, I know where I'm going. And if it took the peddler man three days to get to the bridge that spanned the Liffey River, well, it only took him a day and a half to get back to Ballahadreen again. There, he got the spade out, and he dug under the apple tree that grew in his garden. And there he found all the gold and silver that he would ever need to spend all his days in luxury. But of course, he still had that kind heart. And he shared it out with the people in the community. And they wanted for nothing from that day onwards. The peddler followed her dream. Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness, Sharon. I love it. They're all they're all making this symbol. Everybody is going, thank you for the story, you know. How gorgeous it is, you know, and what old and truths, you know, golden truths. We could yeah. all learn from that story even to this day. Thank you for coming in. I can't wait to see you next weekend. <laughs> and for now, I'm going to release you back into the wild. So I'm going to bring in Gok Dinna just for a second. Look at all them handsome storytellers. Isn't it great? And I, I can't believe that you've all come in at such short notice to celebrate World Storytelling Day. I really appreciate you, you know. So thank you so much for coming. Um, and Baden, I'm coming to you next for a grand old story. So let me see. I have to go to speaker view first and then I have to find you. Let me see. There you are. So, Baden, you're not a bit afraid of, of, of Irish people, sure you're not? <laughs> well, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um, I'm gutted that I can't be there. I know. Um, next time. Not, next time, absolutely next time. Um, I just want to say I'm really sorry to hear that you're not well yourself, that you've got the leggy. And I'm glad to see that it's not knocked you flat on your back and that you're up yeah. and about and with us. Um, and also to echo what you said and what Eamon said and what Norman said, and I'm sure others said before I came in, that the, the whole experience of meeting in Marrakesh, having sort of reached out across the world, literally, yeah, and then to finally meet with one another and be together in the same place and to share times and to share stories and to it was just like an, an unbelievable experience and 
can't wait to do it again wherever and whenever we shall meet Absolutely. and we will yeah we're, yeah we're all echoing that and i suppose on the mm. planes coming home we were so lonesome you know and mm. we were saying that we had to set up this group the mad for road storytellers so that we could be with one another you know even if it was only once every six months mm. so you know i'm so happy that it starts in listol and that i get mm. to, to share the the um the gems of listol with everybody but then we're going back to the UK and I've already signed up for FATE for the Festival yeah, of FATE. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, so how wonderful that we've all found our, our tribe, our little clan mm -hmm. of storytellers. So that's a, that's a real treasure to have found during uh, these strange times, you know. Mm. So we, we seem, as we talk through the day, Baden, we seem to talk about all the things we've found and the things that we've lost have gone into insignificance. They've just paled away, you know, mm. from from all these things. So so I'm looking forward to your story. What story have you for us? Well, what I have for you this afternoon is actually a poem, but the story behind the writing of that poem is very much a tale of lost and found. Now would do you like to hear the poem first and then the story of how it came to be written or shall I tell you the story and then read you the poem? The poem is rubbish. So <laughs> <laughs> get the rubbish out of the way first. Then. Let's get the rubbish out of the way. It's a poem called The Silent Songbird and it goes like this. The nightingale's song is no longer heard in Berkeley Square. Her warm, melodious voice, that joyous, soulful noise, drowned out. Replaced by the raucous sound of media hounds being shouted down by bullish heads of state, by the silent screams of truth sayers, murdered by decrees of wealthy potentates. Her voice could soothe with healing properties that brought to mind another nightingale, one whose ministrations gave relief to broken men who gave their lives in vain. Like her, this songbird's caring streak, her warm and nurturing soul, enabled her to reach and touch so many, to ease the minds and move the hearts of many. But now, her song's no longer heard. Instead, cacophony of warring tribes pours forth from Babel's tower. Uncaring goons spout racist jibes at innocents who perished in fume-filled stairwells during those horrific hours. And we're fed a daily diet of damned lies and statistics. We're bombarded with diatribes by brazen tricksters lusting after power. With airwaves full of static, white noise engulfing ears and hardening hearts, should we be surprised that she stopped singing? Or could it be that we are no longer listening to her song? The silent songbird. Oh, I'm just I'm just uh, coming in with my voice to say that poem is not rubbish. It's beautiful. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. So the story, which and I'm glad Eamon's not here because I know after what I did to him in Marrakesh, he would jump in and say, don't believe a word that man says. But that story is a story for another time. So what happened is that um, I went to an event in North London, which the writers group that I'm part of was hosting. And after the event, I helped the organizer to take some stuff to his place. He lived just, you know, a couple of streets away and I had a car, he didn't. So packed his stuff into my car, drove around to his place, unloaded the car, in the process, I had a folder with some poems and other 
bits of writing that I put together for the afternoon, you know, to pick from, to read out. And I must have taken it out and sort of carelessly put it down and driven off and left it. Somebody came along, found it, picked it up, looked at it and thought, this is rubbish. Moved it from where it was and popped it on top of a hedge out on the road where this woman came along, picked it up, looked at it, and fortunately had more taste, I guess, than good sense, read it and thought, somebody must be missing this. Saw my name on a couple of the pieces, went on Facebook, messaged me and said, are you Baden Prince and are you a writer? If so, I might have something of yours. Got in touch with her and arranged to go and meet her. She handed me back my folder, which was only a little bit rain damaged. And obviously I treated her to a coffee. And just the amazement of this chance meeting and getting my pieces of work back this way, we got chatting as you do. It turns out, she said, that she was a singer, but that she no longer sang. She didn't record, she didn't perform, she didn't sing. She didn't go into the details as to why she didn't, but we talked about other things and I kind of put two and two together, kind of. The problem is I know a lot of musicians. I've got a lot of musicians in my family. If I tell you who some of them are, you'd be amazed. So I'm not gonna do any name dropping. But I guess I didn't seem as impressed and as overwhelmed at the news that she was a singer as maybe she'd thought I would be. And as we were parting, she turned to me and she said, I actually am a singer, you know? And I said, yeah, okay. And she opened her mouth and sang like a couple of bars. And the voice that came out from this woman my God, even now, as I'm saying it to you, I've got chills going down the back of my neck and down my spine. What a voice. And I am somebody who's been seriously into music from a very, very young age. And as I said, I've got a lot of musicians in my family and I was like, oh, right. So this is not just some Britain's Got Talent wanna be hopeful. This woman is an act, this is proper and we parted. We've remained in contact and we've remained friends. I went away and thought, what on earth could have happened to make somebody with this much talent turn her back on that talent? And this was round about the time of Brexit. It was round about the time when the Iranian journalist was murdered in the Iranian embassy, I think, in Turkey. It was like a lot, you know, there's a lot of horrible things happening now. It seems as if there's been nothing but horrible things happening for the last couple of years. But that particular period, there seemed to be like a concentration of evil that was going on. And I walked away and I thought, actually, with everything that's going on, is it really surprising that this woman finds she doesn't have the strength to put forth her voice? Mm -hmm. And we're probably too busy to listen, even if she did. That was the genesis of that piece of writing. Oh my goodness. I tell you, sometimes B Billy, um, Billy Keane from the John B. Keane pub in Listowel has only been saying to me that sometimes um, truth trumps fiction for the best stories. And his father, John B. Keane, is the man who wrote the film The Field, you know, that beautiful film. And um, and that message is resonating through this story, you know. And it, it, there's a sorrow in, in a non, it, in a non appreciated gift, isn't there? In a gift that doesn't get to shine, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Baden, thank you so much for the beautiful poem. 
and thank you for your story. Mwah. Thanks for inviting me and that's it. thanks for listening. We will see you in Kerry soon, you know. So that's a standing invitation. And Cork as well. Cork will be going, Maria Gillen, where are you from? You know, I'm from the king of Barry's Tea, Cork. <laughs> I'll be there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Peyton. So I'm just going to release you back in there now. And I'm I'm going to say that we have a an absolutely wonderful woman um whose name is Gail Jansen. I consider her a Banfassa. A Banfassa is the wise woman um who looks at the legends of Ireland and pulls out their wisdom as medicine. So I'm going to look for Gail and I'm going to say, Gail. I, I'm springing this on you, so I'm I'm I am not going to put pressure on you. But do you have a, a story for us today? Hi, Maria. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, it's great to be here. A shout out to Sharon because Sharon uh, sent me uh, the a message and it just walked in the door, found it, and just turned you on. So Yay! I didn't I'm not in from the start. <laughs> but it's great to be here. Um, great to see you again after so long. You know. I know, it's been a long time. Uh, yep, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, during COVID, it gave me time to do some um, a series of reminiscence stories um, that helped me to look back at my grandparents. And I think we all spent that time thinking about family and friends and missing people that we weren't able to contact with. So... This is a reminiscent story. I hear the voice of my grandmother calling me. I hear the voice of my grandmother's song. I hear the voice of my grandmother calling me. I hear the voice of my grandmother's song. When I was a wee girl, for a while I lived with my grandparents and their house was on a main road and my room was the little box room at the front of the house. Just room for a single bed, a chest of drawers and a nightlight. I loved that wee room. She would pull down the white paper blind. And if there was frost on the outside, the window, there was frost in the inside as well. Ah, sure, we were hardy on them days. But you know, before I would go up to bed, she would slip in a hot water bottle between the sheets, candy striped sheets, two blankets, and candlewick bread spread on top. I would lie there, listen to the cars whooshing by, one car after another, and I would watch, very sorry about that. <laughs> I can do nothing about my phone. <laughs> sorry. And I would watch as the headlights of the car lit up the landscape of my room. And one car after another, like the lullaby, the sounds of the night. And slowly my eyes would be heavy. And I would start to drift off into the land of sleep and dreams. Now, when my grandmother used to come up to tuck me in, she sometimes would talk to me or tell me a story or sing me a song. She had the most wonderful voice. And she said the reason why she could sing so well was because of the space between her two front teeth. I can still hear the lullaby of my favourite song. I peeped in to say good night, and then I found my child in prayer. And for me, some scarlet ribbons, scarlet ribbons for her hair. Some nights, 
she would show me the fan that ran down her arm, roll up my pyjama sleeve and with her finger trace my fan. Gail, we have a fan that runs from her heart right down her arm and into her little finger. And when we were born, well, a red thread is tied around it. And I would lift my finger to look for it and she would laugh and say, it's invisible, you can't see it. But that red thread, it will lead us to all our family, to our ancestors. It will lead us to people that will love us, people that we will love, people that will teach us lessons, lessons that we want to learn and lessons that we need to learn. It will take us to people that will challenge us and to people that will support us and to people who will bless our life. And that red thread, Gail, it is weaving all the way through your life. And it is weaving a red tapestry of your life and the patterns that it makes. Well, that's the decisions that you make in life and the, the roads that you choose to go down. So, Gail, be careful. Be careful what you choose. And then her eyes would take on that far away look that you sometimes see with people. And she would say, you know, Gail, that cord, it may get tangled or knotted and stretched, but it will never, ever break. And that red thread, it connects our hearts together. And it can stretch through time and space from one world into another. So no matter where we are, our hearts are connected. She was a wise woman, my grandmother. She's passed now. But when she passed, my aunt brought me a photograph. A photograph in a beveled frame. I'm sure I knew that photograph well, because it was of me when I was baby. And from the day and hour she got that photograph, it was on display until the day she passed. About five months after, I decided that I would open that frame to wash the glass. And there tucked behind my photograph was photographs stretching back of the family. And I knew, I knew she was saying to me, this is your family, this is your ancestors, you belong and our hearts are still connected. And as my eyes filled with tears, I thought to myself, she is still helping me to weave patterns into the scarlet tapestry of my life. I hear the voice of my grandmother calling me. I hear the voice of my grandmother's song. Thank you. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, Gail, that was gorgeous. I love all your stories, but that one just drew pictures in my head of my own granny, you know, and the red thread of story. I love, you know, how much I love that, you know, so, oh, oh, I have no words. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you. much for having me. Oh, sure, you're more than welcome. Thank you so much for coming. You know, I really feel the support of my storytelling family, Clan Shkelta, today. So thank you so much. And I'm just going to remove the pin and I'm going to say to you all that we've been listened to and we've been watched on Facebook and a fabulous girl who used to live in County Limerick, but went way across the sea to the USA to meet a man and to have loads of tall sons has now come in to tell us a story and her name is Deirdre McCarthy. So let me just find her. Hello, Deirdre. Hi, Maria. That was such a beautiful introduction. Yes, I did. I followed my heart uh, many it. months ago. <laughs> I did. Every it's a bit early. I haven't been talking much, so I'm a bit <clears throat> laryngitis here. But I have a story for you that might kind of tie in with your lost and found. You'll find out at the end. Brilliant. You can tell me if, if it worked or not. So 
It's called Michelin Emmet Auger <clears throat> and uh, could be true. And it goes like this. I met a wee leprechaun one summer's day. He called himself Michelin Emmet Auger. And with his jacket of crimson and buttons of gold, he was a fine vision for me to behold. On shoes he was working as I wandered by. Then dropping his hammer, he gave a great cry, but Jabers is here, give me a scare. Tell me how long you've been standing there. Well, not long, said I, hardly believing my eyes. You're a leprechaun. <laughs> what a lovely surprise. I was out for a walk by this old castle ruin. Now, do you mind telling me, what's that you're doing? Oh, be garrus to see, I'll tell you all right. These shoes I've been working on for a fortnight. And if they're not finished by Saturday morn, I'll have to put up with Her Majesty's scorn, for it's the Queen of the Fairies to whom they belong. So be on your way, little girl, get along. Well, said I that I'll do once you give me your gold, for now that I've seen you, you're so I'm told. So where are you hiding your treasure? Do tell, huh? Is it up in a tree? Hmm? Uh, is it down in a well? All right then, says he. Tis way across the bog, right next to the stream where there lives an old frog. And if you dig deep, you'll find it all right. But you'd better start now, girl, for soon twill be night. And you'll never regret meeting me here today, or my name isn't Micheline Emmett O'Shea. Well, I lifted him up. He was light as a feather. And journeyed we two down the long road together. And when we arrived at the place which was hid, I knelt on the ground. And here's what I did. I started to dig with the stick that I found. While Mr. O'Shea sat himself on the ground. But then his first trick, he decided to pull. Look out, shouted he, tis a wild charging bull. But his prank didn't work, for my eyes wouldn't stray. No, you'll not get the better of me here today. For I had recalled what my dad had once said one night as he nestled me into my bed. If a leprechaun you should encounter by chance, don't look away from him. Hold firm your glance. And if you should manage to not wince or cower, tis then that you'll have him firm in your power. And Micheline said, look, your house is on fire. Said I, you'll not trick me, you crafty old liar. Well, with my stomach now empty and my arms growing tired, oh, I struggled to search for the gold I desired. Something jumped straight up from out of the bog and I turned and I looked up and saw it was a frog. And when I looked back, Michelin, he was gone. Oh. But the sound of his wee little laugh lingered on. Then I heard him cry out, it was no frog at all. <laughs> But my friend, Padraigine, who came to my call, yet you still near regret meeting me here today, or my name isn't Micheline Emmett O'Shea. Well, away down the road, the pair of them went, and with tears in my eyes, near a half hour I spent. And as I sat there, as sad as could be, I saw a girl standing there smiling at me. Hello there, says she. I'm a new girl in town, and I can't help but notice you look very down. My name's Sinead Fanula O'Brien, and if you don't mind me asking you, why are you crying? Oh, you'll never believe what just happened back there. A leprechaun tricked me and ran off, I swear. And softly said she, come to my house for tea. A nice chat will make you feel better, you'll see. Oh, you're so kind. My name's Katie Malone, and I'd give anything for some tea and a scone. Well, from that day forward, a great friendship grew. And now looking back, I can tell you it is true that whether you're young or whether you're old, a good friend is always much better than gold. And I often recall what that leprechaun said as I drift off to sleep in my warm feather bed. You will never regret meeting me here today or my name isn't Micheline Emmett O'Shea. <laughs> a found friendship, a found friendship and lost gold. Is that that book that I've seen uh, recently on Facebook? Was was that the book that... Um, no, that was a different story. Oh my God, you're full of talent, I swear. Oh, sure I am. I'm I can't talented. wait for you to come home and you know you'll be in Limerick, which is next door to Listole. Yes. 
so, you're welcome to come up to Limerick too, Maria. If I don't oh, definitely. Know. We we cross the border every now and again over oh. on the ferry. <laughs> Yeah, you know. So thanks, Maria, for having me. Have, we have loads of lovely sessions. I'm looking forward to it, you know. Oh, I can't wait. Thanks. Oh, for an, another friend found, you know, kind of yes. on the internet today. So it's the World Storytelling Day 2022. The storytellers have gathered, they've come out of the cyber ether to be on uh, this lovely storytelling session today at the drop of a hat. <laughs> so the session also was found, which is great, you know. There's lovely comments um, coming in there about true gold being found and how lovely that was. And there's also messages coming in from Facebook. Um, we have people watching in from the USA, from all over Europe, all over Ireland. Lovely to see you on this World Storytelling Day, you know. Um, and now I'm going to release you back into the wild there, Deirdre, for, for a second. So, um, and I'm going to say, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of our storytellers um, and we're going to be ending with myself. I'm the storyteller in residence for Kerry Writers Museum one year since St. Patrick's Day. So it's just after my anniversary and it's lovely to be here with you in this role. And it's lovely to be here with you with the Mad for Road storytellers, the newly nascent group of storytellers who will never let one another go. We've held on to one another's hands through the cyberspace. And now we've met in Marrakesh and soon we'll meet in Listol. And we're going to just continue this lovely clan Shkelta as we walk down the road, this lovely story family. So there was so many beautiful red threads that I could pick up today. And in the story, you know, looking back on our time with Kerry Writers Museum, it's been a, a, a full of treasure and one of the favorite times for me was when we set up the storytelling circles and people would come on and they'd they'd all melt their memories into one little pot and they'd come up come we'd come out with brand new stories but they were stories that were made from the old memories and we won a great honor we got the honor of being the Beothana hero in 2021 and for gathering the wisdoms of the elders in our population and weaving them into a story. So I thought it would be appropriate to play one of those stories from the memories, some of them last, that came back into this story. And then we found ourselves again in this story, uh, treasures of times gone by. So here's the story. There was a small, solid little woman and her name was Nora. And Nora had a particular pace. It was really slow. And no matter how crazy your day was, or no matter how many things were fighting in your head for dominance, when you'd go into Nora and she'd give you a fine cup of tea and you sat down at her table and you picked up a slice of the currenty bread. Then very soon you'd find yourself breathing more slowly and you'd find yourself nodding along with Nora and you'd find yourself in Nora's pace, the pace of yesteryear. Oh, and the food back then was so nice. It came along the time when all the neighbours would group together in what was called a mehel. And it was before co-ops, but it was the same idea you would help your neighbor to bring in their crop and then they'd help you to bring in yours and by the end of the season you'd all sit in the little field in the middle of the town and lying on your back looking up at the blue sky with the scudding white clouds chewing the sweet grass and there would be brought the food the gorgeous currenty bread fresh from the oven the beautiful Irish butter beyond compare, the real gold of this country, the tomato sandwiches, but those tomatoes were grown in somebody's garden, tended well by them and you could taste the difference in them and a small bit of salt in them. And the tea, the tea in the old cider bottles with the marble on top that would, when you'd go to pour it out, it was never hot tea 
but it wasn't cold either. It was the right temperature for the Mehel Meadow of long ago. And there was a man who would walk the tongue with his horse. The horse was a dray horse with white furry fuzzy socks and the horse always seemed to be smiling. That horse helped every family in the town from bringing people to their graves when, when the time came to bringing the messages when they were needed from the boats to the times when people would be getting married and furniture would have to be moved from one house to another, to the times in the summer when people would go down to the bog and cut the turf and load it into the truck behind the horse. Nobody could remember. Okay. So everybody called that horse, horse, how are you horse? It's great to see a horse. And Connie, who owned that horse and be walking along with him, he was a tall, quiet man who didn't like trouble, but liked to help everyone. There was also a young boy in the village. And at that time, the cinema had just come to Ireland. They called it the silver screen back then, because when you'd sit and you'd look up at the screen, it was all black and white and silver and everything looked marvellous on it. And they had these films called cliffhangers. And the reason they were called cliffhangers was because every week on a Friday, then the two horses would arrive up at the side of the cliff and you wouldn't know if they were going to go over and cause harm or whether they'd be rescued. So you'd have to save all your five bobs so that you could go again the next week to find out what had happened. In those days, the cowboys who were sound out wore white hats and Jimmy wanted nothing more to be a cowboy with a big white 10 gallon hat on top of his head. During the time of the Mehel Meadow, when everything was coming to quiet just before the winter, he went into that field and people were eating their apple tart and their tomato sandwiches and drinking their tea and he saw his chance and he thought he'd take it. And even though he was all laces, two long laces for arms and two long laces for legs, he managed to pull himself up on top of horse's back. How he managed it, nobody would ever know, including himself. And then he wrapped his hands into the reins like he'd seen them do on the big screen. And then he roared at the horse like he'd seen on the big screen. Go on, horse, go on, he said. And if he did, the horse who had never been handled roughly in his life. Sure, Connie was his carer. His eyes rolled back in his head with the fright. He didn't really feel the boy on his back, for he was a big horse and the little boy, he was nothing but four laces. But the fright took hold of him and he started to run down the field. And if he did, the leather of the rain started to cut into poor Jimmy's hands. And the men started roaring. They started roaring instructions. Pull the reins! Let the reins go! Carry on! Stop! And all it did was serve to frighten the horse even more. And Jimmy couldn't hear it anyway, for he was in shock. Until the slow voice of Nora began to penetrate. Ar nahir. A tall nav, and they all joined in. Go for Danum, go dog the riot. And the horse came to a stop, as if he too had gone into the slow pace of Nora. And then she gave Connie a poke in the side, and she gave him an apple. He's your horse, she said. He'll come to you. So she put out. He put out his hand holding the apple in it and he said horse tarkum tarkum mukushla tarkum mukri come to me my heart come to me the very pulse in my blood and the horse came over the field and took that apple from Connie's hand and the men they lifted Jimmy down and Jimmy's hands were bleeding but the women were comforting Ah, don't worry, son. You'll be better before you're twice married, they said to him. <coughs> and he couldn't help but believe them. 
And then somebody put a bottle of tea into his hand and he popped the marble. And somebody else gave him a slice of thick apple tart. And somebody else pressed a silver sixpence, a whole silver sixpence into the middle of his hand. The years passed and Jimmy grew up into a fine, strong man. And there was days he could have spent that silver sixpence, but he never did. He held it in the palm of his hand like he held that story in the centre of his heart. <laughs> I love those stories that we make together, those stories that are pulled out of the hearts of the people that sit around. And so before we go, I'm going to go into gallery mode and I'm going to I'm going to say to everybody, how did you enjoy our lovely day together? You right. can all on mute now. <laughs> I think I have. Yeah, it's been it, lovely. It was terrible. Out. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, I was it was brilliant. Sad I earlier, but I'm really, but I feel very cheered up now because it's um. Whenever we get together, there's always a touch of the exotic, and something special is in the air, yes. and it's very yeah. nice. And uh, and even when Baden's here, it's extra special when Baden comes as well. <laughs> Baden, what do you mean it was terrible? Did I send your granny or grim? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's just kind of rubbing in the fact that I'm not going to be there at the weekend. But I mean, have a wonderful time oh. and I'm going to see you all again soon. Yes, I, and we, yeah. we promise to miss you. We promise to miss uh, you. No, no, we won't. No, you won't. <laughs> oh, I miss you already. <laughs> that was great, Maria. That's it. Can, can I just say two, can I just say two things? Yes, Maria, can I just say two things? There were two things about COVID, you know, that... Uh, the one thing was the, the Zoom. It's been great. Zoom, mm. COVID made Zoom. But the next thing was, you know, do you know the one best thing about COVID? Mm. The public toilets are all nice and clean now. <laughs> Hadder, do you know something else that was absolutely marvellous about COVID? The long beards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Did I hear that you're sick or something? I'm sorry. Yes, dear Joy, I, I got sick last Monday and I, um, you know, being in the public domain, you have to go and be tested. Yeah. So all the antigens were negative, negative, and it felt like a really tough cold, you know, mm. and I began to feel better on Wednesday, uh, but I, I didn't do my live gigs on Thursday for Paddy's Day, just being careful. Mm. But I did go for a PCR test <laughs> and I got I got my my little text this morning to say that I was positive. So no live gigs for the moment. Um, mm. But hopefully it was since last Monday, which means that I should be um, fine again okay, next will. monday yeah. but they've said to me stay in until wednesday thursday at least so i will mm. no. so, you should, so you should be good for the weekend you said, you said okay yeah. for the weekend. Mm -hmm. thank yeah. you for protecting all of those thank you for protecting I Norman, it was hard man it was hard i, I, I know backpacked that... my makeup on this morning and then i got the text <laughs> and i said oh, oh. Mm -hmm. well, what was mm -hmm. then was i put a message in our little group and then people were saying We'd love to tell a story. So I really appreciate it. I feel so special <laughs> that all the storytellers gathered to tell a story, you know. And I, hope you're gonna, I hope you're going to do that again. It sounded like a really interesting theme. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I've done it in the UK as well, Claire. And yeah, um, mm. and, um, it was something to do with the NHS. You know, mm. so they, but that's, that's a, that's a beautiful workshop. And the last story that I told came from that mechanism. It's called the six mm. part story, you know, and it's a way of pulling out the threads of a story and weaving them together. So, mm. um, but we will definitely do that uh, workshop. I, I'd, I'd love to do that with you one day because I, uh, that's something I want to do more of. And, and you seem to real talent for getting good stories out of people. Yeah, oh, I'll tell you, it's just, great. it's just the great people around, you know, with the, with the beautiful little heart, um, you know, gems that they offer into the story, you know. Mm -hmm. so 
special. Like those, like those piece about uh, putting the silver in your hand. Yeah. I was yeah. Like something there. Yeah. So when my grandfather Beautiful. died, my, my son was 10 days old. And a Mr. Twentyman and Mrs. Twentyman mm. put the silver in my hand. And Mr. Twentyman was a fell runner. And now I'm off. I'm going to go and find that story. That oh, oh. There, there was um, there was a, a gentleman that came along to our uh, story, you know, the story workshops that we were having. We were calling them story circles and we used to meet every Thursday morning and the crack used mm. to be empty, and we used to always have our cup of tea with us. And the, the other great thing about Zoom was the breakout rooms. So four people mm. would up in a room together and um, he said that they do in old money. He kept it. He was like, "There's, there's the new money." He says, "But the old money." He says, "The old <laughs> money was art, and it was, you know, because I, I have an old penny from the year I was born, <laughs> and it's, it, 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 they were just thick, and they felt substantial, mm. and they looked beautiful, you know. And he was, he was talking about a silver sixpence that a man had you know we were talking about confirmation money uh, holding on uh, too yeah. tight to money but he was saying there is there is the holding on to, too tight to money but he said for people who've been hungry to have a coin and not spend it was a big deal mm. and he said a, a lot of people would hold on to a sacred coin do you know a coin that would have been given by someone special mm. or had a special memory attached to it you know yes norman I was telling stories outdoors and I told a story um, about a magic uh, harp in yeah. front of a harp maker at a festival and this mm -hmm. young woman came up to me immediately afterwards without a word she took my hand put the coin into it closed my hand over the coin and just walked away <laughs> oh. this is my true goal right here Oh, wow. what a gift. Wow. what a gift. Oh, my God, mm. what a gift. You have to make a story out of that, Norman. You know, I, yeah. I think you're right. And I'm, I will take that as a as a request command. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I have a beautiful uh, a piece of writing from a man that I love. His name is John O'Donoghue and he's an Irish mystic. And I want to pour the blessings out on your heads today for coming oh. and, and uh, being with me in this. So here it is. It is called Banacht, which is the Irish for um, blessing. So let me just pull it up. I should know this off by heart. I say it so often, <laughs> but I don't, unfortunately. So, let me just it won't let me pull. Here we go. On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the grey window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colours indigo, red, green and azure blue come yeah. to awaken in you a meadow of delight when the canvas frays in the curric of thought and the stain of ocean blackens beneath you may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home may the nourishment of the earth be yours may the clarity of the light be yours may the fluency of the ocean be yours May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. <laughs> so John O'Donoghue, I love him. So Thank you. I love all of you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. It's so hard. So. Yeah, it, I, it's so hard for mm. me to press the leave button. <laughs> 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 I'll see you, I'll see you soon. soon. Oh, Good journey. I'll see you soon. I can't wait for the next cup of tea with you. Love you all. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 <laughs>